And welcome everybody. Welcome to the new uh, 22, 2022 uh, season of our webinars. And um, it's good to see familiar faces and some new faces as well. Um, my name is Josh and there's a number of folks here who are associated with the leadership team with, with Alum. And um, we're just excited to be with you all again. We hope to offer some great webinars over the course of the next couple of months and the rest of the year. And uh, we have a number of new board members. Some of them are here today. Uh, we have Lindsay Andrioli Comstock. We have Viva Mima or Miva and uh, Jessica Williams. I might have said your. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, Viva. You can correct correct me there. Um, um, so we're welcoming you all here um, as well. We're just very happy to have some these uh, this, some new energy onto the board, and um, we're excited to you know, to be able to look towards the future together and to try to figure out like what the future of lifelong learning education is. Um, we are working on a new website, just letting everybody know. And Lindsay in particular has been working really hard on that. We're almost ready, I think, to make that live. So that's very exciting. And uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to let people know or to ask about is we're not sure exactly the format, but we're thinking about offering resources, um, things that people are working on, webinars that are open to the public or resources that you might have that you think you might wanna share with colleagues outside of your, uh, your typical organization. Um, you might have something that you wanna share with us, with the rest of the group. Um, let us know and we'll post it on our website, especially once we get it kind of all online, the new, the new one and, you know, we're trying to figure out exactly how and we want what we want to share and what that will look like. But uh, if you have ideas, just let us know. We'd love to kind of pass on what um, the wisdom of the group and what we're all learning together and what we resources we can share together and how we can learn from each other, those kinds of things. Um, we also have a, uh, a way to stay in touch with each other with Slack and not, um, if, if, if you're not familiar with Slack, that's okay. But I will in a few minutes post the link to that or an invite link to that if you're that's something you might be interested in. It's something that we're uh, another way for us to kind of keep in touch because one of the things that we hope to do is is to support each other and to be in touch with each other over the course of the year. So um, that's just one way to do it. And um, without further ado, just take a moment to uh, to uh, introduce Don with us, uh, the Reverend Don Alitz. Is it Alitz or Alitz? It's Alitz. Alex, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, yeah. Um, the Reverend Alex is a uh, part of the Luther staff as the director of the Center of Lifelong Learning. She started there in 2016 and has a, um, over 20 years of experience in congregational leadership and um, is here with us to share a little bit about something that we all know a little bit about <laughs> and have different pieces of experiences. Just how our own journeys with digital learning and what that actually looks like. And I think all of us have been on some sort of journey with that. Um, but Luther Seminary has gone through a very interesting journey with that, that um, Don would like to share with us today. And by way of having a broader conversation about what we can learn, what we wanna take forward, especially in this, um, you know, we've learned a lot in the last two years, what do we wanna take forward with us? How do we wanna balance that with in-person work? and how that all kind of fits together, both on a kind of pedagogical level, but also just on the practical level as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to, to Reverend Alice. Thank you. And I would love to do just a quick go around the room to learn who's here and where you are. If there's one thing that um, Luther is doing more intentionally these days, it's uh, listening and making sure we're thinking about partnerships and uh, where we come alongside one another. Um, so if uh, I'll call on the first person and then if you would just call on another person and we'll try to get through everyone uh, fairly quickly, that would be great. So um, I'll start again, just as Josh said, I'm uh, Reverend Dr. Don Alitz from Luther Seminary. My title has changed. So I am now the Director of Coaching and Events at Faith Lead. And that's part of the story that I will tell. Uh, that's the Director of Lifelong Learning was my title when I arrived at Luther six years ago. So. Um, I think this is, might be my third or fourth title. Um, it's, a, it's an evolving thing. So um, that's me, and I'll turn it over to Stephen. Great, thank you. So I'm Stephen Fetter, and I manage the, uh, the uh, 
webinar program for the United Church of Canada. So I am located in my home office today, about an hour north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. And Erica, you're next on my list. Erica, we can't hear you. You opened your mic, but it's not it's not broadcasting. Wonder if you've got the wrong mic connected or something. Do you have a headset plugged in? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. yeah, I had the wrong mic. Uh, thanks for that. Erica Nisley, Reverend Erica Nisley, I am serving at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin, Texas. And um, Don, I'm on my fourth title, <laughs> which is Director of Educational Design. I've been here about seven years, I believe. Um, and and that's that's me. I'm going to call on David. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm David Gasworth. I'm the VP of Online Education and Learning Innovation at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And I am on my in my 10th month here at Union. So I'm pretty new to the theology school world. I spend most of my time in the public policy school world. Um, I will call on Trenton. Good afternoon. I'm Trenton Farrell. I'm Professor Emeritus of Adult and Community Education at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my doctorate at Northern Illinois University uh, back in the 80s was on continuing professional education, looking at clergy. So that's how I've been interested in all of in its predecessor organization. Uh, I now live in Shorewood, Illinois. I'm a ELCA Lutheran. Um, how about uh, Viva? I'm Reverend Viva Mumma, and I am at Eastern Mennonite Seminary, um, which is an embedded university, I mean, embedded school in the University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And um, I have been here about four and a half years and I've had lots of different titles um, and um, many responsibilities. So I will call on George. All right, hi folks. I'm my first time attending one of these. Um, I am a reporter and a consultant and a pastor in the United Church of Christ. And I specialize in working with congregations that have a, um, that have part-time clergy, helping them thrive. I've uh, written a book on that and, um, and interviewed Helen Blyer, who pointed me to, to this event um, and to this group. So I'm really interested to learn uh, how you're doing how you approach that, uh, equipping people in that uh, area. And I'm uh, in Swampscott, Massachusetts. Um, I will call on Sarah. I'm Sarah Erickson, the Director of Lifelong Learning at the um, Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. And I've um, had this in another title in this field um, since the early 2000s. And I'm a United, I'm a Presbyterian Church USA clergywoman. You want to call on somebody, Sarah? I was just looking around the room, um, and I will um, call on Richard Rouse. Hi, I'm uh, Rick Rouse. I'm in the Seattle area. I am uh, vice president with Alum, and I've been with the organization for a long time. Um, in continuing education for clergy. Uh, I'm connected with Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and uh, I'm gonna call on Jessica. I am Jessica Williams um, and I serve as the Director of Alumni Engagement and Lifelong Learning at Central Baptist Theological Seminary in Shawnee, Kansas. And I'll call on Catherine. Catherine, me, Catherine? Is that okay? All right, great. Uh, I'm Catherine Malloy. I am at uh, Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, I've been at the seminary for about 10 years, but I've been in my current role um, for a few years, and I'm currently 
I think in the process of changing titles. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, this is my first meeting here. So I will um, call on the other Catherine, the Catherine with an A in the middle. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, hi, my name is Catherine Laster, or you can call me Kate. Uh, I don't always remember to change that. Um, I'm currently the Senior Director of Lifelong Learning at Meadville Lombard Theological School, um, the Unitarian Universalist School here in Chicago, Illinois. Um, pretty fairly recent, recently came onto the position and into the school. Um, and in previous iterations of my life, I've been a, a, an assistant associate professor and field education director and just kind of um, have felt more of a call towards administrative work as well as the scholarly work. So glad to be here. Thanks for hosting. And I will invite uh, Helen Flyer, may I? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm bumping on late. I'm actually walking out of my school's board meeting. <gasps> to be with you guys. Um, I'm Helen Blyer. I serve as the Director of Continuing Ed here at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and it's great to see some familiar faces. I echo Josh's sentiments in the chat. And I am not sure if anybody else has not spoken since I've come on late. Can you raise your hand so I can call on you, or are we, are we done? We have a few more. How about Maureen? I'm Maureen. Maureen Elizabeth Hagen. So, we can't uh, hear you. You can't? Oh, now we can. <laughs> um, I can hear you. So for uh, two and a half years, until um, end of December, I was the uh, dean of our local theological school for leadership in um, the diocese of Episcopal Diocese of Oregon. And right now, I am a catechist and resource developer for Baptized for Life through Virginia Theological Seminary. Thank you. And uh, Jewel, are you listening in? Yes, I'm here. I am driving, so I'm trying not to be too distracted by um, showing you my picture. That might distract you. Anyway, um, I am at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana, and I'm the Dean of Lifelong Learning there. And um, I think I, Israel was on there a bit ago. Good. I was on. wondering who to yeah. choose because I'm not able to yeah. see. So that's fine. Is there anybody we've uh, missed other than that? Good. Thank you. Thank you. So it's good to see um, um, who all is in the room. So um, as I go and shift here um, so I can share my screen. And I think I'm, I'm fairly sure that most of you have been on, uh, on Zoom and all of that enough, but just to know, I'm happy to entertain questions as we um, go through this presentation, but I can't necessarily see you as, uh, as I'm presenting. So feel free to unmute and ask questions if you have things along the way. So as um, Josh introduced me, uh, we, I'm at Luther Seminary. Uh, I came as the director of the Center for Lifelong Learning. And what I'm going to tell you today is a story of our past six years, the six years since I've been there. Um, and as I do that, um, there are just a few like caveats with, that I wish to, to say. One is, um, uh, I don't know if this journey is replicable <laughs> by anyone else, but I think some of the processes and, and ways that we went about it are, are helpful to think about for other groups coming through transition processes. And um, uh, please also note that any decisions that, that we've made along our path um, do not reflect judgment on people who make other decisions on that path. <laughs> so you'll see that there are a few uh, key uh, switches that we make along the way. Um, but with that little bit of information, uh, as we get started, I'm going to go ahead and dig in. So I had to use the Wayback Machine um, in order to grab a site of what our, our, um, our website looked like when I arrived um, back in 2016. Um, the Center for Lifelong Learning at Luther Seminary um, was a lively, uh, lively piece. It had three main uh, areas that it reached out to. 
It reached out to clergy for continuing education. It had a pretty active school for lay ministry, which was an, an arm, a, a set of classes and a program to raise up leaders, often in the rural setting. Um, that came on campus for a few days, three times a year. And it had something called the Lay School of Theology. That was, uh, that, that were courses that our faculty taught that anybody could come to. And uh, this was often uh, done by, um, taken part by people who were older. Um, but they would come and they would spend a Monday evening for three or four weeks and get to take a class with our faculty. And we had some really high at that time. These were the ways that we delivered, um, we delivered these educational things. We had in-person events. This is all going to sound very familiar to you. We had uh, online events, what we called online events. This typically meant that our, one of our live events had been recorded and that people were able to tap into it afterwards. Um, we had conferences. Uh, we had four conferences that we held on our campus, uh, three that we held on our campus each year. We had the convocation that was uh, in the dead of winter in January. And we had um, uh, the craft of preaching, which was in the fall and our rethinking series that was in the summer. And then our big festival of homiletics that traveled around the country. But this was all on our campus. And then we had two digital properties, Working Preacher and Enter the Bible, which had sort of been uh, launched and were doing well. Um, and, and for the most part, they were kind of um, uh, just going along as the stream carried them. And this is how it worked. We had a small team. That small team was a registrar, an events coordinator, a digital person. That person did all the web design, the video, and the podcast. Um, all of our marketing was done uh, with a catalog and postcard. I would work really hard all summer and get all the courses lined up for the whole year, put it in a catalog, it would go out. People would sign up on a sign up sheet. This, it's really hard for me to believe that this was just six years ago. Would sign up, you know, often on a registration sheet, mail that in by a check. Sometimes we'd be able to handle a credit card that was still new for us. And our, um, our center was funded mostly through Luther Seminary as a part of the seminary's work. Um, and then we had um, course fees and grant funding that helped. Um, but even as I came, we were pretty aware that that was no longer working. And um, I can share a few things that, um, that were very obvious. One is that the social and the physical plant infrastructure was changing uh, minute by minute. And that was that um, Luther Seminary had experienced some downturn in students on campus. Our campus was far too large for the students that we were now um, engaging in class on a regular basis. And so part of our campus was um, in the process of being sold off and we were trying to minimize our footprint. So this meant, that those conferences that we held on site uh, no longer had the expansiveness like a you know convention center would have. We had we were starting to be limited in what the seminary could offer. Um, and with the two main things that were being dropped, dining and housing in particular, we lost the you know the student apartments and the student rental rooms. Um, it affected both the conferences and that school for lay ministry where the the people from rural areas would come in for a few days. Now the travel costs of them coming and then staying became too um, costly for them to make that trip regularly. Um, another piece that uh, we found was breaking was that faculty um, at, our, at our site didn't have anything in their contract to sort of help them engage continuing ed as part of their duties. So anything that we asked of them uh, had to be on top, both financially and time-wise of what they were already being asked to do. And um, again, many of you are probably very familiar with this. Those, 
those instructors, those faculty members that the, the school for lay ministry and, and other clergy really wanted to see were the most popular, also had a lot of other speaking engagements. And uh, they weren't always putting our engagements and our asks at the top of their list. And um, often asked for, um, I'm not gonna say that it was an unreasonable uh, cost to their, for their time, but it was a high cost for their time, which made, mean, meant that our conference fees and our course fees had to keep rising. And that was difficult for our people. The participants uh, we found were aging and were asking for different ways to sort of engage the material. Um, they wanted to come on, uh, come on campus, but uh, they didn't wanna come in the winter and they didn't wanna come at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so once again, you see the time and the ability for us to sort of serve them was getting squished. And I think the thing that, um, that for me was maybe the most telling of all was that a clergy would come up to me uh, after these events and they would say that they had been incredibly inspired by the speakers and they loved seeing their colleagues and they weren't always sure how to take this deep theological knowledge or whatever it was that they were learning and take it back to their congregation. They, they were saying that they often felt a disconnect. And so um, I had already started working on some of these pieces um, on how to, you know, could we, could we do things, uh, we had already started playing with Zoom a little bit. Could we do some of this lay ministry online? Could we uh, record or stream out uh, some of our instructors teaching so that people wouldn't necessarily have to leave their homes? And um, even as we noticed all of that, and we're talking about all of that, um, a team of us got together, um, which we called the, the innovation team. Um, we were really trying to follow a page out of um, uh, adaptive leadership and really work our way through the dilemma that we found ourselves in, not only on the, the lifelong learning side, but also on the academic learning side. And one of the key things we did was uh, we stopped regularly and we dwelled in scripture. We thought that if our work was really about raising up leaders for Christian communities, that our work should start there as well. So, Throughout this presentation, I have given, um, I've put in a few verses. These aren't just verses that I've dropped in. These were verses that we actually, as a team, dwelled in at these certain points of, of this process. So toward the beginning of this, um, of this process, we were in Acts 16. And um, in Acts 16, it says, Paul and his companions went through the re region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they come up, had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. And so as we stop at that point, I'm just going to say, what catches your eye in this text for you, thinking about continuing education? And just feel free to unmute and speak up. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Yes, we spent a lot of time on that too. And the spirit of Jesus did not allow. We wondered what that meant and what it felt like. When what we had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross. Yes. We immediately tried lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes it felt like we were crossing an ocean. <laughs> what else do you notice? 
being convinced that God had called us. Yes. To claim the good news. Yes. And our team was convinced of that, that we were called to, to do something and be something a little different in this time. Anyone else? Paul had a vision. Mm -hmm. Paul had a vision. A couple word, of us had a vision. Yeah. <laughs> word pleading. Yeah. Pleading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking at that too. The man from Macedonia pleading. Yes. Our leaders were pleading for us to find ways to get through this. We could see. Um, I mean, if you want to remember back to 2016, 2017, our leaders were already hurting. They were there. We could see some of the writing on the wall that there were going to be conflicts coming down the road, that there was going to be difficulty. And um, I had a lot of people coming into my office and saying, how, how can Luther help me in this? How can you help lead me in all this? So that was our scripture. I'll say the one thing that, um, that led me is you'll notice at the beginning, it says Paul and his companions went through the region. So it's like, it's somebody else's story. But then it's Paul had a vision and it said, um, we immediately tried. So it all of a sudden becomes personal and you are part of the story. So I think when I first came and our, our um, innovation adaptive leadership team was trying to get a handle on what was going on, it felt like everything was moving out there. And then at some point we took the reins and said, okay, this is where we're gonna make our next step. But we had a lot of questions, <laughs> a lot of questions. And these are the ones that I think guided us the most. Um, what is our why? why? Why do we do what we do? Um, who is going to focus on this work? I don't know what it's like in your space, but it was always, uh, I can't, I don't have time to do this. My plate is full. My job description is too full. I can't do this. So there, it was a serious question about who was going to focus on the work and who had the ability to make the decisions on how to advance the work. Uh, who actually is our audience? Who are we trying to reach? And how do we reach them? And what does this business model look like? So we were starting to uh, address these in 2018, 2019. And this is what we came up with. The why, um, we were pretty, um, we were clear that our role was, uh, we're gonna stick with the, the vision mission um, of Luther's, uh, mission of Luther Seminary saying to educate leaders for Christian communities. But we also crafted a new vision statement that said that Luther Seminary was called by the Holy Spirit to lead an in innovation for the sake of the gospel. And I think that there are a few key pieces that came out in that conversation where we started drafting that uh, vision statement. One was that whatever we did, it was not about the survival of Luther Seminary or the survival of the Center for Lifelong Learning that we were, um, we knew according to all the budget projections that we had a nine year runway. So our, uh, our plan, our viewpoint was that we were going to um, really point our planes down the road of discipleship and of raising up and equipping leaders. And that that did not always say when anybody said that, um, my job, and sometimes we even said it of ourselves, but my job might be affected by that decision or my department might be uh, affected by that decision. We sat with one another in grief and longing and losses and said, I know, but I think this is the way we need to move. Um, so in all of our work, there, is a, there was a definite shift and conversation that this all had to be for the sake of the gospel. Otherwise, our work as a seminary and the Center of Lifelong Learning actually wasn't going for the correct why. Don? Yes. Was this a vision for just the, uh, for the entire 
seminary that was crafted or just for the the, the vision or what do you want to call it of the work that you were uh, working on? Yeah, this was a vision for all of Luther Seminary. This was a vision for all of Luther Seminary. The impetus came from a group that sort of came out of the work that the Center for Lifelong Learning was doing. But at that point, it was very nebulous about which, which piece was doing what. Um, partially because the, the center was pretty small um, and uh, uh, insignificant, you know, relatively insignificant in the, the income and the, the people power that was there. Um, we just happened to have, if I, uh, there are lots of gifts. If the gift I brought to the table was I'm good at convening people and I'm a coach, so I coach people into the next step. And so I was able to coach some really great thinkers um, from being in separate places, trying kind of uh, hitting their heads against the wall into coming together as a team and getting their, their, um, their thoughts and their visions united and moving in the same direction. Um, next comes the who questions, right? Who's going to do it? Um, and who are we reaching? And so um, when the, the vision statement was put out, um, the president of Luther Seminary actually put into place um, the innovation team more firmly and dedicated, um, put together a group of us who's, uh, who were called to do this, who were committed by the seminary to pay attention to this work of innovation. We knew we had to change the way we did things. We knew that there had to be um, some people sort of dedicated to the work of new leadership and new ways to reach out. This was a different group than it had ever been uh, really put together before because it was both staff, faculty, and some outside people. And we sat at the table as equals and uh, really argued and uh, uh, tested each other in how we were going to move forward. We also did a lot of listening, which is um, uh, not something that we had done for a while. Uh, we had a lot of uh, faculty who were very focused as is appropriate on the, the area of their learning, um, but they being so deeply in their areas of learning hadn't necessarily kept up with how that relates back into the, the congregation and into Christian daily life. And so staff often were the ones who were good translators and uh, people who weren't uh, faculty or staff, but were coming in from church often had really good questions like, what the heck are you guys talking about? And so we found new ways to communicate as this group. Um, the second question that came up was, uh, who is our actual audience? And at this particular point, um, we decided that the focus would be um, uh, ministry leaders. So we dropped the clergy language um, and put this lifelong learning, uh, this piece into um, anybody who led in a Christian community. And that could look many different ways. And um, it meant that we changed a lot of the wording on our websites and our materials and um, meant that when we went to reach out to invite people to things, we wanted to make sure that we had a different level, typically, of who was speaking and why they were speaking, that they were speaking to um, a, a pastor who maybe knew had a great theoretical knowledge or theological knowledge, but needed to know how to apply it. Or maybe we had great everyday Christians who were coming in who were leading that needed that theological tweak. So we were trying to find a new altitude, um, is what we called it, of learning. Uh, at least for our, most of our public facing things, we uh, checked our language. Is it too deeply theological? Um, we have great language, but is it distancing people from Christ? Um, so all of these questions, you can see how question after question comes. But our landing place at this point was. Um, we have a dedicated team who is going to focus on reaching our ministry leaders, whoever those leaders may be. Um, how are we going to reach them? 
man, however we could, we, we had, um, we found it was really hard. Um, you know, emails again, we were still working with postcards and catalogs. Um, we knew that that was clumsy. And I always knew that the minute that the catalog went out the door, that something was wrong in it, that a date was wrong, that, you know, something, uh, something would be amiss no matter how many times we proofed it. And so our communication strategy, we knew it needed work. We're just gonna leave it there. And Lord have mercy. There was no way that a normal, uh, our normal business office within the seminary who was accustomed to receiving tuition and paying faculty and staff um, was going to be able to be the right business model for us now moving into something new. So several of us learned things like business model canvases. And uh, I see some heads nodding. <laughs> um, we had to think through some of these questions. Who are we actually trying to reach? Who are our partners? Um, what are our cost structures? Uh, I was sort of guessing like, oh yeah, they could charge this much for that class last year. That's how much we should charge. Maybe add a little bit more on, you know? Um, there, we had not done the, the background work to figure out how much things uh, cost for the, the center. And to be honest, we had no way of knowing because everything was so tied up with, uh, with Luther Seminary. And Luther Seminary hadn't done some of that same work to be able to cost it out to us. So we found ourselves in the midst of a lot of complexity, but we were working through it as a team. And then we need to take time to breathe for another dwelling. And so this dwelling is from John 15. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. So let's take another moment and breathe and share with me what you see. Just thinking how how seldom we really want to do any pruning because it hurts. Yes. In some branches of the seminary, I'm known as the woman who killed the 180-year-old uh, convocation um, because that gathering that happened every year, you know, somebody brought to me the stacks of all the programs, but. Um, it didn't have a place. It wasn't bearing fruit. What else? Well, I think some things may work for a season. And then we have to realize that they don't need to be always entrenched. And we have to be looking for other opportunities and areas that may show promise. And that requires a lot of flexibility, which church structures tend to not have much of. Yes, the minute you we do one thing that that works, <laughs> I'll put quotes around that that works. Uh, you know, we start planning the second annual, right, um, version of it, and uh, we tried not to do that. I just really see 
the, the line where it says, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So bearing fruit is really tied here to abiding deeply. And, and Dawn, what I heard you talk about is, is the mission and the vision that you had. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it is not often in my experience that a group of um, outside leaders, faculty and staff come together and become vulnerable in prayer. And I, I would be very remiss if I didn't say that was a key part of how we developed it as a group and found a way to trust in, um, uh, in people's visions as they came forward to say, that sounds true to what we've heard. Let's give it a try. Rather than um, being suspicious because this idea came from this person or because it was going to benefit so-and-so or because it would be using whatever funds. More often than not, we were able to say, as we were thinking about next steps, we were able to say, I think I hear this step makes sense with scripture and the way we've been dwelling together. Any other thoughts? Okay. And then we all know what came next. March of 2020, um, coronavirus hit. Um, it was six weeks before the festival of homiletics and ex estimated 1800 people coming to Atlanta. Um, the festival for us is a key part of our funding. Um, it's not only just a, a great reach out for people, um, but it literally, it's, if it, if I had to pay out all those funds, and re refund all of the money and to sort of somehow make that all right, my center would have been done. Um, we would not have had much, uh, much left. We, we worked on a pretty tight shoestring. And so this, um, this really meant that all the questions we had about wondering if we should shift, if we could shift, were we ready to shift, were, okay, we're shifting. This is, this is what's going to happen. And we made a very, um, a very quick piece. We um, moved right away and we moved the Festival of Homiletics online. It was uh, a horrendous six weeks, I'll just say, um, full of both God's grace and just a whole lot of work. Um, we offered it for free. So we did, we did actually, um, offer people their registration funds back and also invited them um, to uh, either purchase recording packages because we were going to, to do recordings of everything or if they wish to donate to Luther Seminary to help us hold the festival, they could do so. Um, but I needed to offer it for free because I had no idea if we had the ability to actually pull this off. And I would far rather deal with um, we did our best, <laughs> then have a lot of people come back to me and say, I paid you $300 and it was awful. Um, and I knew that our team just couldn't, they were working so hard that they would not be able to take that sort of criticism afterwards. So we were able to do it. We, um, we were able to gather um, sermons and presentations from 60 speakers. Um, we got them online, we streamed them. We were too nervous to do anything live at that point uh, because we just, again, we didn't know how all of it worked. Technology, uh, if you'll remember back then, you know, things would drop. Um, who knew what anybody's internet was going to be like? Even some of our recordings had to be redone and we had to move people around so that we had them. But um, the map in front of you shows what happened we actually had 15,000 people request to have access for the Festival of Homiletics, which uh, it, it was far beyond anything we could ever dream. And it was all around the world, all around the world. I have no idea what those people in the middle of the ocean are, but um, 
this is where they dropped their pin <laughs> on one of our exercises. So all of a sudden, um, we were able to see just how far the message could go and um, how far our preachers um, could speak. So it was, um, it was a hard push. Uh, the festival worked. We learned a lot. And we had a little time to breathe. And then we had to keep going because we still had two more conferences, one more in June, one more in October. And everything that we were getting ready to offer online or, or in person, as far as courses, everything had to be moved online. And none of those teachers knew how to do things online yet. So um, this is my wonderful team. <laughs> this is our Christmas party. Um, and in addition, our team, you know, is now working apart. So we had so many new things that we were trying to do um, and ways that we needed to learn how to work together. So one of the things as this sh uh, shift continued is that um, we made a decision uh, about some donor and some grant funds. And in the past, um, donor and grant funds had been for specific purposes to support like a, a certain group of pastors for an event or to hold a certain um, uh, a certain class or to do um, some specific work. We decided, because um, we were in the middle of a, of a Lilly grant, that um, now because we were not sending everybody, like flying people everywhere so that we can meet in person, that we would take that funding and we would think of it as seed money. We would make the technology shifts and the staffing changes that we needed to make in order to move to the next level of our digital life and our communications. We did that through, um, uh, we redid um, one of our websites entirely to something that was far more robust. We moved into e-commerce so that people could, could pay for um, things online and with a credit card instead of sending us checks. Um, we found ways uh, when we had techno technological work that we didn't, no one had the skills to do within Luther Seminary. We brought contractors on for a little bit. Um, so we found ourselves working uh, with places such as Upworks and other places like that, that have a really, really skilled talent. Um, yes, it does cost more per hour, but it allowed us to buy 40 hours of that incredible skill, complete a project and then be done. So we really worked with some new business models and put a new foundation and a new business, uh, some new business models in place. We um, also invested in an actual business coach for my colleague and myself um, who could help us through thinking through all those different business model pieces um, in, and allowed us to start putting wheels on something that would look more like a nonprofit, no, like a separate nonprofit still fully embedded in Luther Seminary. And another dwelling, <clears throat> this time from the book of Luke, Luke 5. Jesus also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sold, sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine that says the old is good. So, what do you think when you see that one? It's a perfect verse uh, for anything that you're trying new. Um, just don't try to repackage it in, in the old, but look at new ways, innovative ways to deliver and, and share the gospel. 
Yeah. This is the point when they're, um, they became to be more of a rub, I would say. Uh, the tension is, is, uh, was high between what um, we would call the academic side, the, the side of Luther Seminary that um, is focused on raising up uh, student seminarians to become pastors and leaders. And um, the reach and the ability of what faith lead, um, now we've, we've changed our name from Center for Lifelong Learning, we're now faith lead to faith lead um, now with a reach of 12 to 14,000. Um, we have um, our own income coming in that's quite robust. We have um, attracted uh, the attention of some key donors who have invested in uh, the way that they see us trying to think of new ways of doing theological education and um, being able to still work with some of the major funders such as Lilly. Um, we also work with Siebert quite a lot and Kellogg. So we have the funds and um, now the concern that we had to think about was as Faith Lead now finds its own footing, um, there is a limit to how much we can put back into the institution because if we put all of our funding back into the institution and they have not yet found their own way to be sustainable, um, we will lose our ability to keep innovating. And so we are still, I would say very much in that stance. Um, we're working alongside, um, we have, we call Luther Seminary, we say inward facing, but we don't mean that in a negative way. It means that they're tending to the students who are going to be um, the professional leaders and we're outward facing that we are working with um, uh, current leaders and, and, and developing new leaders. Um, but we have also charged them now with finding a new way as an academic institution of making themselves sustainable. And so all of the innovation work that we've been doing is now starting to roll over into what I would say the seminary proper and they are starting to do their own work in this. That's separate from ours because we are both together and different. It's uh, different days means that uh, means that uh, the the Venn diagram are either closer or further apart, depending on how the day is going. So we're back to our questions. We've uh, we've just reached a new point in our development. We're back to what is our why? Who is going to focus on this work? Who is our audience and how do we reach them? And what does this business model look like? And so what is our why? Our why is still to reach out and um, equip leaders for Christian communities. And we're wondering more and more if we need to actually reach back to, to, um, uh, to develop disciples. Um, there's a part of what we do that we see leaders are very difficult to shift from the models of leadership they've already learned. And so working with um, the idea that there should be different ecologies of leaders diff uh, and different ecologies of how church and communities should look, we are reaching out um, to see who God might all be already be raising up as a leader, even if that person is never um, going to come to seminary for a variety of reasons, um, you know, distance, uh, uh, financial reasons, time. We are interested in helping them develop the skills that they need to be a theological leader or a leader of the community. So our why is, is shifting. Uh, we need more people at the table. We um, are a much bigger team. Uh, when I first came, I was the only director. Uh, as of January, we now have eight directors. Um, and that is because some of the faculty uh, positions, particularly in stewardship and rural ministry, now have come to join the faith lead team, primarily because those two areas, in particular, students weren't very interested in engaging while they were in seminary, but they really wanted to engage them once they were in their rural parish or once they had to handle a church budget. 
So by, by fitting those two faculty positions actually primarily in faith lead and giving them space to be out and, and networking and working with people and congregations, we expanded their reach and the way that they could work. They do also teach a class on the academic side, um, but just one, um, and it works quite nicely. And um, other directors have allowed us to increase our diversity. Um, one of the directors is SEEDS. That's the, the um, arena I just explained to you. Their, their role is to reach out and network for people who have, feel the call from God to lead Christian communities, but may not ever be headed to seminary. Um, we're also working, uh, the areas that I used to do is classes. That's sort of developing its own thing of what do online classes work with. And as I said, I'm working now with coaching. Um, we learned that leaders, um, in order to make the, the adaptive changes that they need to make, um, it's hard to do that by yourself. You need someone to help keep you on track. So um, I've been building up our coaching base and currently we have about 71 coaches that are ready to go and the ability to match those, um, match leaders who come to us wanting a coach to help them with these adaptive challenges. Um, with someone who's trained to do so. And um, how do we reach them? Uh, lots of ways. We network a lot. Um, we try to find people who know people who know people. We listen for people who are doing things, um, places that are doing things similarly to us and we learn about technologies. Um, we're trying to streamline. We have uh, our Faith Lead Learning Lab, which is a platform. It looks very much um, it's built on Mighty Networks, which is uh, sort of uh, a Facebook and a course module all on its own. And um, I'm not sure that that's our final place, but there are lots of different technological places we're finding, mostly about creating space for people to meet and to experience things rather than a way to deliver material. So our shift is it's not so much about how do I get my information to you, but how do we create a space where we can share what we know together and find resources um, as we need them. And the business model, whew, complexity. <laughs> I, there's no picture that I could really show you right now for what we're trying as far as a business model. What I will say um, uh, to the, to my health and the health of many around me is that one of the directors that we hired is a director of business operations. And we, we uh, brought on someone who was familiar with startup nonprofit um, business models. And that person is now taking both what we are trying to do and being a liaison with Luther Seminary's business office so that at that point where those two meet, that it makes financial sense and transparency that we need. But then once you go beyond that, that the seminary's finances look like the seminary's finances and our finances look far more like a startup. And she is, uh, she's four months into the job and she's still working on it. Um, it's, she said, boy, this is a hard one to crack, um, but she's working on it and it's, it's really lovely to see um, actually, the relationship with that piece, the relationship with Luther Seminary and Faith Lead, I believe has improved because we're now finding places where, where we intersect, that we have more, um, more knowledge on how to best intersect rather than uh, some of us saying, we just have to do it different. You know, someone that can say how. So here's basically um, what it looks like now. We have a team of uh, a permanent team of about 15 people, including dedicated faculty, staff, and administration. We use a lot of contractors for our digital support. Um, we do almost all of our uh, financial tra transactions online, e commerce. And our funding now is mainly, you'll see that this is flipped in order participant fees, grants, donors, and Luther Seminary. Um, and we're still um, finding out exactly how that, that um, ratio has changed. So that um, is really the story of the past six years. 
I have no happy or no like a great tied up ending because it is still, you like to say, um, uh, building the airplane as we fly it. There are a lot of details. And um, I hope that it maybe gives you some things to think about as you think about the, the transitions that your own space needs to make. So I put a couple of questions down. Just what catches your attention in this story? Um, what questions does it raise for you? And um, what God might be saying to you as you think through this story? So I think what I'll do is I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Um, and I'll just, if you see Faith Lead, um, you can, that's what our logo looks like. That's where we are. And I'll stop sharing and uh, take questions or hear your reflections. Is Don? Yes. Did this happen, did the initiation of this whole process that you described early on, was this before the current president came on? Was it after the current president at her instigation? Was it kind of coterminous? Was there a relationship at all between that? Uh, it, it was, um, it's a little bit hard to say. She had come briefly before I had come. What, and um, they, were, we, they were trying to work on some things. What I will say is that, um, that when I came, what I saw was a lot of brilliant people going in a lot of different directions, not working together. Uh, and, and the piece that I, I think I brought to the table was some really hard work of bringing us together as a team, even though that team has shifted across the years and people have come on and, and gone off as, as seen fit. But um, uh, our current president has been very much a part of, of the conversation and supportive and um, has really been able to make some difficult conversation, have some difficult conversations with with board members and with, um, with donors as we go through this. Uh, Josh, you have your hand up. Thanks so much, Don. Um, that was wonderful. And I, my question, I'm thinking very, not to sound too, uh, well, I'm sounding very practical or maybe money centered, but I think that the money issue is really going to be a lot on people's minds. And I think that so many of our programs are dependent on seminaries, on larger institutions, and yet you're describing a model that suggests financial viability, maybe even outside or maybe alongside a seminary model. And so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, to what extent, um, what, what are you being able to, how, how is that money making actually working? How is that income generating working? Um, did you have to file a 501? Did you have to become a, your own 501c3 and kind of set that all up independently of the of the seminary, or is that you know all together with it? Um, and maybe like to what maybe if you feel comfortable sharing, I don't you know it all depends mm -hmm. on what you feel comfortable sharing. But um, what percentage of your income is from your own generated resources um, selling those online versus uh, what's being supported by the seminary? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so a couple of things, uh, the team works with, um, a stance that God is a gracious God and that will, God will provide what we need to do. And if the funds aren't there to do something, then maybe that's not what God needs us to do right now. Um, so that's, that's been one of those things that has driven some of the hard questions. Um, and so, so I'll say that, um, that doesn't mean that we don't think they're good and worthy things. It just means that maybe we, we, this team, this, in this place, in this setting, aren't the ones to do it. Um, having said that, I think the other, the other mental shift we made is when we get a grant, we really do think of it as seed funds. So, um, we, we don't think of how do I preserve my job and the, these other three jobs with grant funds. We, um, we up, till, up till now, and I would say for the next two years yet, have said, Luther Seminary, will you invest in us by paying for you know, these four staff positions? 
and the funds that we get from grants are going into us building something different for the future and working towards sustainability. Um, we're, we're still early enough and we, we are not a separate 5013C. We are definitely a part of Luther Seminary. It's just that our, our models are so different because one has money coming in and out all the time as people pay registration fees, as we pay instructors and coaches. Um, and that just was driving again the, the business office, which is accustomed to paying and uh, paying faculty and staff and taking intuition, very different. And so the fact that we have our own, um, not a whole business house, it all actually still runs through the same office, mm -hmm. but we have a person on our side who knows enough of the language and the, the newer models to help us get everything in a line in alignment on our side and pay in batches and send it across the business office who then can like put it through their systems and pay in batches. Um, so we had to learn new ways of, of doing things. So I would say, yes, it is very practical and you have to make mental shifts. I hope Thank that you. answers your question, yeah. Can you tell us, Don, who the new, um, who, can you tell us who some of the new funders are who are, who've been drawn to this new model? Yeah, they're private donors. There are some, yeah, it's, um, um, we are very aware. So I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll say our bias as we go forward here. We're very aware that we can do, um, oh, thanks Jessica for coming. Um, uh, we're very aware that when you, you utilize a lot of grants, that those grants want to have a say in how you proceed. And, and, and at some point, um, that gets really difficult. Like if we're trying to do something really new um, and a donor is not sure they want you to go in that new direction, <laughs> um, we had to say then maybe, um, maybe we don't want that and we don't want that grant, which believe me, that was a hard conversation that we had to start having. Um, but what we are finding is that there are actually some um, startup investors out there who are good and faithful people, and they are super excited to think about what the church might be in its next rendition. And they are really excited to see how leaders might be trained differently. Um, and so we have found some of those startup investors uh, who have been um, putting funds in. How did you find them? <sighs> networking, networking, networking. If there's one thing I can, I can say um, without any ounce of reservation is that the, the uh, seminary relations department at Luther Seminary is extraordinary. Um, and they were able to really bring the innovation cause before key donors. And those key donors were excited enough to share with people that we haven't even noticed. I actually, um, um, I actually received a $50,000 uh, donation for my coaching program out of the blue um, because people are hearing that there's something new going on. They're like, wait a second, I wanna, I wanna do this. So rather than um, some of the older, um, the previous donor, donors that we had were very much Lutheran, very much wanted uh, seminarians raised a certain way, um, and they were not interested in innovation, we have now developed a new, or in the process of developing a new pool of, of leaders who actually want to, are, are hopeful about what the next ca chapter of church might be. Yeah, I have a question. I've been listening, even though my camera's been off. What was the, what created the urgency that gave rise to this amazing innovation effort? Um, I, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a lie. I mean, when we first started meeting together as a group, I think it was, you know, self-preservation. <laughs> For the, I, we for the can, whole seminary? The for the whole seminary, but especially, you know, for me, I got on my first day of being there as the Center for Lifelong Learning and the CFO, um, you know, took me aside and, 
and showed me how we were not making money and how he expected me to turn that around in a very short amount of time. And I really had no idea how I was going to do it. Um, but then right on the heels of that, I would say um, that the other urgency came from our leaders were hurting. Um, our leaders needed us to do something different. God needed us to do something different because the gospel has something to speak to this world at this time. And if we were really stuck on self-preservation, we weren't going to be serving that mission. And so really the shift to this is all about the gospel. This is all about our leaders. This is all about our people rather than this is about keeping the Center for Lifelong Learning or even Luther Seminary alive. Then that, that was a, that was a, I mean, I remember the feeling in the room when somebody first said that out loud. Well, <laughs> not to be too cynical, but um, this was something that faculty felt and were moved by, <laughs> you know. I, I can't say that we had 100% everybody on board. What I will say is that we had a small devoted group of faculty and staff and outside people that worked very closely together to start a small movement and then a slightly larger movement and then a slightly larger movement. And I think um, uh, I can say honestly at this point, there are still faculty who are not really crazy about the, the things that we're doing. And I will also say we have a lot of faculty who actually are excited about the possibilities that we're offering now and are actually coming on board with some of the things we're trying. So um, I understand and have seen your cynicism. <laughs> and um, uh, this was not an easy path. Uh, it's, a, it's a great story, but it was not an easy path. There, we've, uh, many of us have been hurt along the way, um, but we supported each other. And we really thought that this was the, the, the movement we needed to do. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Catherine in the chat asked a good question about, speak, uh, about maybe about the timeline, uh, how you, when you rolled out everything, maybe a little bit about when, you, when each step kind of took place. Yeah, so, we, so I came on board in uh, 2016, 16, 17, 18, we were kind of in that like pruning, are things, are, are things working? Are they not working? If things weren't working, I was sort of shutting those down so I could put funding toward those things that were working. Um, I was moving uh, what I called the altitude of the learning to a different space so that people, uh, while still engaging those faculty that they really, really loved, also had something to take back to their congregation. And then really when the pandemic hit, because we'd already been playing with some of these things um, and we were ready to move things online. I mean, we were, we really were trying to figure out if, you know, like we kept checking it, are you ready? Should we move things? Are you ready? And then the pandemic, we hit and it was like, now, just now <laughs> move. And um, uh, everything was just so slow, but that's, I mean, that's where we started moving all of our stuff online. And, um, and so we were probably offering between 2020, 2021, we probably put 30 courses online. And again, because they could be online and because we had that beautiful list created during the Festival of Homiletics, all of a sudden we had quite an influx of people who wanted to take those classes. And so within a fairly short amount of time, that's why I said, I don't know that, that our story is replicable but I think that the process that we went through is, and I think that it could be fruitful. So, um, and, and the, just the way that we've done partnerships um, too, gathered with people. I don't know if that's enough. It, honestly, I don't know that I could do mo much more of a timeline because it's been so blurry. <laughs> it's been so fast. <laughs> Catherine and then Sarah. Well, along those lines about how it's not necessarily replicable, but potentially could be helpful to others. I'm wondering, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm new here. I'm wondering, is this recording going to be available to us? 
And Dawn, would you be willing for us to like share it with our team members to, to say like, we're not alone. We're not, we're not the only ones who are, are in processes like this. And, and um, you know, here's, here's what they went through and we recognize it's going to be a little bit different here. Yeah. But there's a lot of that that, I mean, you probably saw me during your whole presentation just sitting here nodding because so much is very similar. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm fine with the recording being shared with your teams. I think, um, yeah, if our story can be helpful, <laughs> um, by all means. Uh, I, I mean, one of the things that our team has, has realized more and more, um, and this is also a change, you know, sort of from the seminary faculty this is my thing and we have to hold it. Um, when we made the shift to really trying to be more gospel centric, um, if we're about creating disciples and you're about creating disciples, what gifts do you bring to the table? What gifts do we bring to the table? And how can we mesh that? So I'll just give a really quick um, example and then Sarah, I'll, I'll come back to you. But um, uh, ELCA Coaching Network, so I'm the director of coaching, uh, I knew the person very well who was leading the coaching network for the ELCA. She and I were good friends. We did things together. Um, and um, I discovered that a lot of things she was working on were things I needed. And ELCA was only paying her for a half-time job. So I um, invested some of my coaching funds in uh, contracting her for, uh, for half-time or, or however many hours she worked per week and gain some of her um, knowledge of the network, knowledge of how she'd put you know, forms in place, all of that. And she gained our, um, our platform and ways to gather people and ways to hold classes and train people. And so that was a way that we've been doing this back and forth. She's now going back full time to the ELCA, but we'll keep partnering. Yeah, Sarah. So I was curious of, uh, and I've taken at least one of brief of your offerings through Faith Plus Lead. Um, what mix um, of your offerings are totally asynchronous versus a mix of synchronous and asynchronous delivery? Or, how, you know, how do you, yeah. what's going on right now? Because <laughs> What's not, going on right now? It's like, how do I answer that? Um, almost everything is synchronous right now. Very little is asynchronous. Um, the one exception to that that's thriving is, um, I think earlier I told you there was that school for lay ministry for rural leaders. Right. And uh, that was with like a known group. We'd work with that same group forever and ever. And before the pandemic, I was trying to get them to, to be okay with a Zoom offering. They would have nothing. They didn't want to touch that with 10 foot pole. Um, and to be honest, most of them still don't, but we created one anyway. And this is, we partnered with um, uh, the Seminary of the Southwest, right? The Iona Library. We partnered with them. We got some of the Iona pieces and added some Lutheran um, elements from our own. And we now have a, a facilitator coach who gathers a, a cohort and uh, they travel for a year and they go through those materials. Um, but they see they view all the materials offline and then they come together and discuss and worship together and do that sort of thing. Yep. And we've offered two rounds of that and we've sold out both times. So while the, the synods that originally didn't wanna do it at all, I finally said, I, I can't create something that you want, but I'm still gonna create this because I think there's need for it. Because we've been doing, again, the piece maybe that I didn't lift up enough is we did a lot of listening. We did some surveys. We sent right. our PAs and our faculty and our staff out um, uh, um, before the pandemic. And we did a lot of surveys at the beginning of the pandemic saying, what do you need? Um, and so when we offer a course right now, the courses we are offering is because uh, leaders are asking for it. You're no longer working from what do the faculty want to teach? Thank you. Yeah. I see some smiles and some head noddings. You must have gone through that stage too. 
or are going through and or are going through <laughs> or will go through it again. I can't, you know, we're in, I, this is all cyclical. Who knows what I'll be doing next week? Right. Yeah. Anything else you guys are asking? Great questions. All right. Well, um, in the Melissa has a comment in the chat about the you know sort of getting at the partnerships and multi prong. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that this that the Alum community has talked about trying to encourage cross institutional or organizational mm -hmm. partnerships. Yeah. And um, you know, as I as a sort of transitional support, I, I want to you know. Um, affirm our interest in helping connect people who are interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we hope you find this to be a place where you want to pick somebody's brain and maybe form a partnership yeah. that shift yeah. that that may um, you know unsettle and shift your institution. But hey. <laughs> you know, there, yeah. you know, what happened to Paul in prison? He got out of prison because there was an earthquake. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I, this is not a comfort. It's not a comfortable space. Um, there have been, you know, some difficult uh, partnership conversations because when I'm talking with someone, I have to know that that other person is ready. Um, is not looking just to support again and shore up their institution or their body, but they are really looking to deepen. The connection and the equipping of the of the leaders around them, and so as I go through some of that that conversational piece and the own searching as we're doing things, if I find that gospel connection, I'm far more likely to go ahead. Um, as you know, in the past, it was a lot of times like, "Well, how are you doing this?" and "How are you doing this?" and I had to leave those conversations behind because I had to go after a slightly different vision. So I'm, I'm always open for those, uh, these, these new, um, you know, who are you serving and what do they need and how are you getting there and what do you need to get there? Yeah. Great. Well, I think Josh, they look uh, happy, but uh, exhausted by the Zoom conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and thank you so much. Uh, virtual round of applause for you. And, uh, and thanks again. We always do this in our, That's in our great. context. That's great, thank you. The, the jazz hands are good for, for Zoom. Um, yeah, and we, we to that end, um, hopefully we can continue the conversation. You know, we have uh, ways of connecting through social media, through, future webinars through, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at using Slack and some other means. And so ways of continuing, maybe Mighty Networks in the future, maybe that'll be how we do it, but who knows? Who knows? But, but so much of what we're hoping to do um, and what people have said again and again about what they appreciate about, about Alum in particular is just the relationships that they form and the connections. And for those of you that are new here, um, again, a big welcome and just an uh, invitation to join us in further conversations and and Dawn also uh, invitation to you to continue to pop back in from time to time and let us know how you're doing and share your resources and wisdom and just to be a part of the conversation as well so um, and to that you just shared us an example of, of innovation in in theological education and then the webinar in April is going to be us continuing to have this conversation we, we had a very popular webinar last year on um, how to evolve, how to um, have, um, oh gosh, my, my brain. <laughs> um, my, I it just, the, oh, design thinking, design thinking. Sorry, it slipped in my brain for a second. Um, but we had a very popular webinar talking about design thinking and iteration and, 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 and practicing and trying new things and thinking, kind of getting, it sounds like a lot of those things that you were just talking about. And so yeah. in April, we'll have more conversations about that. Um, and so you're all invited to join us for that. And um, thank you again, uh, Don. And um, anybody wants to hang around and 
chat for a few more minutes, but I see a lot of people need to head out. So we're so glad that you all were able to make it and yeah, to be a part of this. Thanks for the afternoon for the ability to start the show. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate it.